Today we're going to have a look at a question that involves parametric equations but using them in a sort of unusual way that's a bit less familiar to what you've normally done. So let's have a look at it together. The following parametric equations each have the same Cartesian equation. Hmm. Uh, you've got this fact here which apparently applies to one, two, three different parametric equations and then you can see these equations here, they're stated in sort of a two-dimensional vector form here with your i and your j unit vectors. What's going on here? Well, we know that you can have parametric equations that sort of map onto a specific Cartesian equation. The parameter here in this case is t, um, and you know, we'll often use something like t or r or theta. r is obviously taken here for the names of the equations themselves. And we're used to a particular parametric equation sort of mapping to a specific Cartesian equation. But one of the important things about parameters is that you can define different parameters for the same Cartesian equation. That's what's going on here. Um, each of these three equations, if we were to eliminate the parameter t, uh, we could then say, well, what's the Cartesian equation in terms of uh, x's for the i vector um, horizontally and uh, y's for the j vector, which is vertically, right? And that is what we're going to do. You can see here in part one, it says determine the Cartesian equation. So we're going to need to do that. But if you do that for r1, r2, and r3, you'll get the same Cartesian equation. But there will be differences between those three parametric equations, even though they all, as it were, sort of fit along the same path. Uh, and that's what this question part one says. Explain the difference in the domain of all three paths. And then part two starts talking about the direction of travel. So we'll get onto all of that um, shortly. But first, let's just try and wrap our head around how a single Cartesian equation can have multiple parametric equations and the difference that that makes. Uh, the most classic example that I can think of, which we've encountered before um, within the context of, well, actually all the way back in year 10 potentially, is when you think about the unit circle, okay? Now, we have the, uh, the circle that's centered on the origin with a radius one, and we connect it to the trigonometric functions. And this is the way that we um, determine a way to uh, express or evaluate uh, angles of any magnitude in a trigonometric function. Because of course, we begin with trigonometric uh, ratios, so you're in a right angle triangle and so the only angles you can handle are acute angles because that's the only other kind of angle in a right angle triangle. But then we say well what if we had um, obtuse angles um, so more than 90 degrees or what about when we have reflex angles which can't even exist inside a triangle so that's why we appeal to the unit circle for that. Now hopefully it rings a bell that when you think about the unit circle, um, our standard way to, I guess the, the technical term is to parametrize the um, unit circle is to define um, some particular angle, I'm going to call it A for angle here um, rather than the, sometimes we see theta as well. Um, and then you take a particular angle and it maps you onto a specific spot on the unit circle. Now let's just think about some particular places here because I'm going to give you a contrasting example in a second, right? If I have an angle of zero, you can see that cos zero is just going to be one and sine zero is zero. So that's why we're here at one comma zero on the, um, you know, there on the positive real axis, right? But then as the angle increases, you can see we start to move anti-clockwise around this circle, right? So if we go all the way up to say pi on two, I mean roughly, stubby fingers, sorry about that. Um, you can see here, cos of pi on 2 is going to be 0, you can think about what the cos curve does, and then sine of pi on 2 is 1, and so that's why you're up here, well you know, I, I, I tried to get as close as I could, uh, I want to get to about 1.57, but I don't think my fingers are going to do it. Anyway, you get the idea, I'm pretty close there, okay? Now obviously as you then keep on going, all the way from naught to 2 pi, it gives you all of the different points on the unit circle, and it just goes round and round and round as you're familiar with, okay? And the important thing I want you to notice as you're seeing this is, if we go right back to the first quadrant here, right? When you start off at zero, um, as you uh, increase the angle, what's happening to cos? And the answer is it's decreasing, right? Think about the cos curve, starts up at one and it just drops down towards the, um, the x-axis, right? What that corresponds to here is your x-coordinate is decreasing, right? It decreases all the way from naught over to pi, right? Because if you think about the cos curve from naught down to pi, um, or across to pi, I should say, the cos curve is decreasing. So your x coordinate in this space is decreasing. 
What about the y coordinate? Well, when you think about the angle increasing from zero to pi, um, when you think about the sine curve, it starts at zero, it goes up, and then it goes down. And that's exactly what the y coordinate does here on the unit circle. As I move from naught to pi, you can see, here's my y coordinate, imagine it going up, and then once you hit pi on two, it starts to come back down again, just like the sine curve does, okay? Now, like I said, this is the standard parametric equations um, for the unit circle. X equals cos of your angle and Y equals sine of your angle. But this is obviously not the only way to think about the unit circle parametrically. If I just uh, take off that corner there, and if I think about an alternate way of measuring this, let's actually put us back at um, zero. Spoilers slightly. Uh, what's going on here, right? Well, what I've done is I've defined the uh, the coordinates on the um, the coordinates rather on the unit circle's circumference as rather than cos theta or cos a sine a, I've just reversed my cos and my sine. So you can see I'm making sine the x coordinate and cos the y coordinate. Now. What's going on here? Well, a couple of things. For starters, when my angle is zero, I'm not starting on the positive real axis here. I'm starting on the positive, um, <laughs> positive real axis, you know, the complex plane. Uh, I'm not starting on the positive x axis, I'm starting on the positive y axis. Why is that? Pardon the pun. Well, when you take sine of zero, sine of zero now corresponds to the x coordinate and sine of zero is zero. So that's why you can see I'm along x equals zero, I'm on the y axis, right? And correspondingly, cause a um, when you have cos zero, that's going to be one. So that's why vertically now, I'm up at one. What happens now when I start to increase the angle? Before I do it, um, maybe you saw it before I did it very quickly. Before I do it, I wonder if you can picture what's going on here, right? We noticed that sine, it starts um, at zero and then it goes up and then it comes down, right? That used to correspond to our vertical, but now it's going to be our horizontal, right? So it's going to start at zero. You can see I'm at x equals zero at the moment, but it's going to increase to begin with until pi on two and then it will decrease. Think about what that's gonna mean horizontally to increase from zero and then decrease in horizontal terms. And then think about what's gonna happen for cos, right? When you start from zero, cos of zero is at one and you, as you increase, you know, cos zero, cos pi on six, cos pi on four, cos pi on three, cos pi on two, all the way, you're decreasing. That's what the cos curve is doing all the way to pi. So think about what that means vertically. You're going to be decreasing all the way from naught 2 pi. All right, are you ready? I'm going to press play on the parameter a now, and um, what's what's going to happen to this green point? We'll just watch it, right? Do you see what's happening? I'm moving clockwise, which is the opposite direction to how I was moving before, and I wonder if you can see why that is, right? From naught to pi, my horizontal coordinate, it's increasing all the way up to pi on 2, and then it starts decreasing again once you hit pi, because that's what sine does. It starts with zero, it goes up, and then it goes down. A better way of saying that is it increases, then it decreases, but now sine is the horizontal coordinate. So horizontally increasing corresponds to moving to the right, and then horizontally decreasing corresponds to moving to the left. You can see I'm now moving back toward the x-axis. In exactly the same way, um, the cos uh, coordinate, which is the y coordinate now, it steadily decreases, or maybe steadily is not exactly the right word, it sort of changes in gradient, but it decreases all the way from naught to pi, and that corresponds to vertically decreasing from one all the way down to negative one, which is exactly what um, the cos curve does. And that's why you can see when I hit play, right, um, I start at a different spot, namely um, up on the positive y-axis, and I go in a different direction. So you can see here how the x equals sine a, y equals cos a set of parametric equations gives me the same unit circle, but it, it helps me move around the unit circle in a different way. I've got a different starting location, and I've also got um, a different direction to move in, okay?